was driven by the narrow self-interest of the various players with virtually no government oversight. So let me briefly talk about the kind of chain of causation here, sort of how it played out. Seeking short-term profits, self-interest, banks pushed loan underwriters to approve questionable subprime mortgage loans. Now, defaults on those loans weren't a problem for the banks because they bundled the loans together and, and divided them up and sold those split bundles to other institutions, primarily hedge funds and large investment banks who were looking for quick and easy profits, self-interest. But in the case of default on those underlying loans, the insurer AIG developed a kind of insurance, the credit default swaps that I mentioned earlier, which in theory protected those holding these bundled uh, mortgage securities. And that was in AIG's immediate self-interest. In 2005, AIG's profit margin on credit default swaps was 83%. They had 83% profit on credit default swaps. Maybe that came back to bite them, but that's another story. Now, so long as the housing bubble lasted, these firms made money hand over fist. But when the bubble burst, the value of the mortgage-backed derivatives collapsed, and then narrow self-interest kicks in again. The banks, looking after their own survival, stopped lending to other banks. Credit froze up. Corporations began to find it hard to borrow money short term to meet payroll, to buy supplies, and so on, and they laid off employees. They were also looking for their own survivals, their self-interest again. And then, of course, average Americans began to find it hard to get car loans, student loans, and credit. Well, the theme that goes through here, I think, is that throughout this story, the pursuit of narrow, uh, immediate self-interest led to a financial collapse that no one really intended. Okay, it's an unintended consequence. Everybody lost. Now, clearly, the ideology of self-interest and unintended consequences has failed us. So, I'll move to the second part here. Christian teaching. What resources does Christian teaching offer? I would argue that the, the problem with libertarian economic arguments, like the ones that I've described, does not lie in their emphasis on self-interest, per se, rather than altruism or benevolence or compassion or something like that. The problem is that they reduce self-interest to the narrow individual self-interest of essentially separate individuals. They like those billiard balls again. So they're seeing people as, as billiard balls that are basically unconnected with one another and occasionally bump into one another. And let's call this uh, immediate self-interest. And I'm using that, that term uh, because it suggests two things, both of which I intend. One is that this is short-term self-interest, okay, immediate in that sense. But it's also immediate in the sense that it's not mediated through the social fabric, all right? It's not mediated through the relationships uh, with other individuals. It's basically, basically has to do with the individual's own actions on her own behalf. Now, at times, it seems like Christianity also appeals mainly to that immediate self-interest. The hyper-individualistic Protestantism that one often encounters in the United States, and especially here in Texas, um, emphasizes personal salvation as a matter of the individual's private, interior relationship with God, rather than one's web of relationships. And some evangelical Christians carry this individualism into the economic sphere as well, making anti-government arguments similar to uh, those of Walter Williams that I talked about earlier. For instance, Pat Robertson, so you can all boo at this point, but Pat Robertson <laughs> has attacked the progressive income tax as a form of theft. And he claims that the Bible places 
quote, absolute importance on private property rights and wealth, end quote. But if we look to the teachings of Jesus instead, and read them without this distorting lens of American individualism, then we find a very different message. And alongside immediate self-interest, we also find Jesus referring to what I'm going to call a wider self-interest. Wider self-interest. You know, the reasons for calling it wider self-interest will become apparent in a moment. In um, the story of Jesus' encounter with the rich young man in the Gospel of Matthew, it's Matthew 19, some of you may remember that story, we encounter both types of self-interest, immediate and wider self-interest. This young man, according to the evangelist, had great wealth. He comes to Jesus and asks what he can do to receive eternal life. And Jesus responds that, in addition to obeying the commandments, he should sell his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor. And upon hearing this, the young man went away sad, the evangelist tells us. Well, the reason for his sadness is clear. He's caught between these two forms of self-interest. Okay? Um, his attachment to his present self-interest, his immediate self-interest, his wealth, hanging on to his wealth, threatens to deprive him of his wider self-interest, the wider sharing out of his possessions with, with the community, basically. And um, also, uh, that wider sharing out will lead him to communion with others and also to eternal life. The two, eternal life and communion with those others, can't really be split apart. And after the young man leaves, Jesus comments, many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. We can read that a whole lot of different ways, but I'm going to suggest that we read it this way, that those who are, who are attached to their narrow and immediate self-interest may end up jeopardizing their wider self-interest. The story teaches a profound lesson. It's really hard for each of us to see beyond our own immediate self-interest. It's really difficult. And the Christian tradition recognizes this inability as sinfulness. Sin. Now, Christians are often tempted to interpret this second type of self-interest, what I'm calling wider self-interest, solely in pie-in-the-sky terms, uh, having strictly to do with individual salvation, understood as some kind of reward in heaven after death. But that sort of thinking is just the religious equivalent of, of the we're all in this alone ideology in the economic sphere, because it focuses on the individual's personal fate, quite apart from his or her relations with others. And for many Christians, the gospel ends right there with individual salvation. But that doesn't do justice to the deeper implications of Christ's teaching. When Jesus tells the rich young man that to have treasure in heaven, he must give his wealth to the poor, Jesus is saying that the young man's wealth and easy living are bound up with the poverty and the suffering of others. And even more important, the young man's salvation is somehow bound up with the fate of others in the wider society. 